All right, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of President uh, Fred Kemp and the entire Atlantic Council family, I'm honored and delighted to welcome one and all to the Atlantic Council this afternoon. Uh, we're really uh, pleased uh, and honored to have Deborah Lee James, the 23rd Secretary of the United States Air Force, as our esteemed speaker. First and foremost, we'd like to say welcome back to the Council, Debbie. You're part of our vast alumni uh, network out there, all of whom we're proud of, uh, particularly you and all of your accomplishments. It's great that you're taking the time to address and engage this wonderful gathering here at the Atlantic Council today. I'd also like to acknowledge the support of our partner in the series, the National Defense Industrial Association, which is represented here today by its Chief Executive Officer, General Craig McKinley. In addition, a distinguished member of NDIA's Board of Directors, Ellen Lord, the CEO of Textron Systems, is here this afternoon and will approach the stage momentarily to introduce our speaker. Now, the Secretary's address today will be the seventh event in the Atlantic Council's Defense Industrial Policy Series, which aims to be the preeminent platform from which public officials address government stewardship of defense industrial resources. It reflects our recognition that government's partnership with industry is a vital thread in the overall fabric of U.S. national security and of the national security of its allies and partners around the world. Indeed, this very proposition was central to the establishment here at the Council of the M.A. and George Lund Fellowship, which is held by Steve Grunman, who will join the Secretary on stage for a Q&A portion of the event following the Secretary's remarks. In her still short tenure as Secretary of the Air Force, Debbie James has had to tackle the full gamut of issues involved in running an enterprise of the enormous size and complexity of the United States Air Force. From strategy, personnel, budget, to the politics by which our government comes to consensus about the hard choices these topics require. Her address here today will focus on yet another of these very tall tasks, the acquisition management system. And I know we're all very, very eager to hear her insights on this topic. Now I'd like to welcome President and CEO of Textron Systems, Ms. Ellen Lord, to the podium to introduce Secretary James. It was almost exactly one year ago today that Ellen was here to deliver her own address as part of our Captains of Industry series. So Ellen, it's really a treat to have you back. The floor is yours. Thank you, Governor Huntsman. It's an honor to be here at the Atlantic Council again. I believe that both the Atlantic Council and NDIA provide a really important forum for government industry dialogue. We need to move forward productively through these discussions, especially when we're in times of tight budgets and real technological change as we are today. We're very appreciative that we have Defense Department leaders who will continue to engage with industry, discussing different ways of doing business, different ways of acquiring goods and services, and listening to innovative ideas that industry has to assist the department with those efforts. And certainly, the Atlantic Council, NDIA, and this policy series have made an important contribution towards these ends. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize two members of the Air Force, Assistant General, I'm sorry, Assistant Secretary Bill LaPlante here with us today, and General Janet Wolfenberger, Commander of Air Force Material Command. Thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us this afternoon. So it's a very special honor for me to introduce the 23rd Secretary of the United States Air Force, Deborah Lee James. I believe that Secretary James has been in the position just about a year now and um, has previously served in a variety of diverse leadership posts across a range of government and industry organizations, including working on the House Armed Services Committee staff as Assistant Secretary of Defense and as a Senior Industry Executive at SAIC. It goes without saying that Secretary James is highly regarded as one of the most knowledgeable leaders within the department regarding the total force with joint expertise in active guard and reserve issues. 
I personally have had the great honor of participating in recent Air Force Industry Roundtables, which Secretary James was very instrumental in initiating. These critical forums are crucial to our collective efforts, and I want to personally reiterate that kind of senior leadership. Outreach is very much appreciated by those of us in industry. Certainly, Secretary James is uniquely positioned to lead the Air Force in these changing and challenging times. So please know that we're very appreciative of your taking time out of your schedule, and we look forward to hearing your insights. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you, Governor Huntsman. And thanks very, very much to everybody from the Atlantic Council and also for NDIA for joining together to partner and make this um, event possible. And thank you so much for inviting me in particular. Also, just a quick shout out. I know that we have a virtual audience who is with us today. So for those of you who are watching via the live stream, thanks for joining us um, as well. Uh, in just a few weeks, President Obama will be releasing his budget, our budget, uh, to Capitol Hill. And we in the Department of Defense are hopeful that we will be funded above the sequester level. But no matter how the Air Force is funded, it's clear to me that one of our key mandates must be to be uh, good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars and to make sure that we spend those dollars in the best fashion possible. In fact, to use my phraseology, we need to make every dollar count. It is one of my top three priorities. I hammer home on it uh, all the time in a variety of ways and what making every dollar count means to me. But the fact is, no matter what we have done to date, we have to do more. We simply have to stop spending more and more of our precious dollars in order to get less and less of an output. Now, for those of you who have been tracking on defense issues for a good many years, as have I, you may recall back in 1986, Norm Augustine cautioned that by the year 2054, the entire defense budget would purchase a single aircraft, a single aircraft alone, if the costs continue to go up, 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 as they had been going at that point. Well, that might sound like a crazy statistic, but clearly, we can't let it happen. And the point is, we have got to stop spending more and more in order to get less and less. So what we have to do is we have to bend that cost curve. The curve currently goes like this. We need to bend it so that the costs start coming down, down, down. And indeed, this is going to be a key topic of discussion for me this afternoon. Um, I also want to talk to you about something else that I'm pretty passionate about, and that's about how we need to speed up all things acquisition. Because today, we in the Air Force, and I think I can say this broadly across the Department of Defense as well, we are simply too slow in all that we do. So let me just throw out one sort of horrifying factoid for all of you to consider. We currently average 17 months to award a contract in situations where we know there's only one supplier. So this is a sole source environment, and it currently takes us, on average, 17 months to make an award. And I say that is simply too long. We also have great difficulty adapting in the Air Force to new technologies, rolling new technologies into existing systems and acquiring new technologies, even though our future in large part depends on acquiring such technologies in order that we keep our technological edge vis-a-vis -vis our potential adversaries. So now, some of you may recall that this past summer, General Welsh and I released a new strategic fr uh, framework document entitled A Call to the Future, in which we talked about the need to institutionalize a concept that we coined as strategic agility. Strategic agility means we need to be more flexible, more adaptable, more responsive, and we have to speed it up, be quick in all that we do. And when I say all that we do, I mean everything from the recruitment and the development and the management and the training of our people to how we develop and purchase our equipment and our weapon systems. Specifically, strategic agility, when applied to the world of acquisitions, should, if we do it right, not only help us bend that cost curve, but it should also help us stay ahead of our adversaries and counter some of that tremendous uncertainty that we're feeling in the world 
it's because we'll be able to move more quickly and better take advantage of some of that cutting edge technology. Now, Frank Kendall's Better Buying Power and Secretary Hagel's Defense Innovation Initiative, which of course is overseen by our deputy, Bob Work, are in whole or in part targeted at these basic same goals. And again, those goals that we're all shooting for is reducing our costs, moving more quickly, and improving our technological edge. In the Air Force, we are trying to be very complementary to these umbrella OSD initiatives, and our attack plan is what we call bending the cost curve. Now you might ask, okay, you've got a bending the cost curve initiative, how is that really different from the better buying power initiative? And that's a fair question. And my answer is this, unlike the better buying power, which is a broader set of practices and techniques for the workforce to employ, our Bending the Cost Curve initiative is um, a targeted initiative, which is designed to encourage innovation and active industry partnerships to improve the way that we procure our systems and to drive down costs. So the bottom line to all of this, and Ellen is a great straight man, she's teed me up very well on all of this, is that I personally have been very focused on this whole area since I became the secretary, and uh, I am not alone in this endeavor. Uh, General Welsh is all in in the effort. He has been very instrumental. And as Alan already mentioned, we have several of our key leaders that are right here in the audience today who have been driving this train. And again, Dr. Bill LaPlante, uh, who is our Air Force Acquisition Executive, and Janet Wolfenbarger, the Commander of Air Force Materiel Command. A third individual who I want to recognize is the Director of our Transformational uh, Innovation Office, Dr. Cameron Gorgonpour. So these are the key leaders that are driving this train forward. So how are we going to get there from here and achieve those three goals that I laid out? Well, in order to tell you that, let me go back to about that one year ago point when I first became um, secretary. And it was almost at that very point, because as Ellen pointed out, I came out of industry, so I didn't uh, come to these ideas uh, just like that all at once. I had been building toward this for years. Um, so I believed, and the chief believed right from the get-go, that in order to achieve our goals, we really needed to double down and improve our dialogue with industry so that we could better understand how our processes and our procedures and some of the choices that we make, sometimes inadvertently, contribute to rising costs and the stifling of innovation and the slowing down of process. And by the way, in so doing, we thought maybe industry could, le could learn a thing or two as well. Therefore, we have been meeting in earnest since February of 2014 with industry reps, and I want to, again, thank those who have helped facilitate this dialogue to include uh, the AFA, the NDIA, uh, and the AIA in particular. There have been some other industry groups that have helped facilitate as well, so we thank you very much for making that happen for us. And as part of these roundtables, we have been asking what might seem like some basic questions, but they're tough questions, and they're frequently with complex answers. What are the barriers to introducing new technologies? How can we speed this up? How can we improve transparency so that you and industry have better insight earlier on into the process, into our thinking and what we think we need? How do we spend taxpayer dollars more on products and less on bureaucratic processes? So these are some of the questions that we've been asking, and we've gotten what I consider to be excellent feedback from industry. We've been listening hard to them, and they have been listening hard to us. And so today, with your permission, I'd like to uh, kick this up a notch and share some of the progress that we've achieved and some of our next steps. Um, and to do that, I want to tell you that we have arranged uh, a series of our initial initiatives under bending the cost curve into three focus areas. And I call those three focus areas enhance, expand, and improve. Enhance means we need mechanisms to better interact with industry throughout the acquisition life cycle. Expand means we need to increase competition among traditional and non-traditional industry partners to drive down costs and to increase innovation. Improve means we need to carefully examine our own internal processes and develop mechanisms to drive down costs and to speed up our acquisitions. Now, with these three focus areas in mind, let me now cover some of the activities that we are planning. First, under the umbrella of enhancing interactions with industry, we are launching a new Cost Capability Analysis Program, or CCA. 
Now here's our thinking. We believe that by gathering data from a range of sources, it should be possible, should be possible, to identify instances where perhaps small changes in capability could have a very large impact on cost. And this in turn, if we would choose to exercise such an option, could mean that the Air Force could develop much more affordable weapons systems. Now let me give you a for example. For example, if we had a requirement for a new jet and the jet needed to fly 500 miles per hour, if that was our thinking, if that was our requirement, but if we discovered through this process that we could achieve significant cost savings by amending this requirement to 450 miles per hour, meaning trade off that little bit of capability, then perhaps we could use that knowledge to make uh, trade-offs in how we develop our RFP and our evaluation factors, and maybe we might even choose to modify that requirement. So that's the idea of the CCA, the cost capability analysis. Now you may be thinking, gee, hasn't this approach been done before? And the answer is yes, but. So yes, this approach has been done, and this approach has uh, delivered certain successes. In fact, two years ago, we in the Air Force did certain pilots under cost capability analyses. But two years ago, there was no formalized process for industry to get on board uh, to have that crosstalk with us on a regular basis. And so the effort of two years ago was somewhat limited as a result. So what bending the cost curve will do is under our new CCA, we will develop that specific industry engagement process. And we hope ultimately we will reform the way we talk to industry and when we talk to industry about our thinking and about our requirements. And obviously it's designed to do it earlier and more frequently to keep that crosstalk going. Um, our Bending the Cost Curve team, again, three of whom are sitting right here with me today, are developing that specific process now. But today, I am excited to tell you that we are going to demonstrate this new capability on four programs. And those four programs are the TX Jet Trainer, the Long Range Standoff Weapon, the Multi Adaptive Potted System, and our follow on to the Space Based Infrared System. Now, all of these programs were selected because they represent a range of use cases and segments within our industry. Um, now, when it comes to TX, we're about two years away, we think, from the request for proposal stage, and this new process should allow us to directly engage industry as we develop an understanding of how to best evaluate our objective and our threshold requirements. So think of that as your higher level requirements and your bare minimum requirements. The other programs I mentioned are at different stages in their acquisition process. And we think the fact that they are at different stages will give us a, power, a powerful comparative for learning the nuances of how to best engage industry around requirements. OK, moving on to the expand category. Uh, when we talk about expanding competition, I'm kind of um, uh, interested and excited to tell you about something we call Plug Fest Plus. Plug Fest Plus. Now, let me back up a moment. A Plug Fest is something that exists today. It is a specialized industry event where companies collaborate and demonstrate their existing capabilities in live demonstrations before government customers. OSD's Defense Intelligence Information Enterprise Program has established an entire community of practice around these events, and they the events typically occur a couple times each year. Now, these are very well regarded events, but at the moment, plug fests in their current form have no associated contracting action. So here's how it goes industry might attend a plug fest event. The government customers could well be wowed by the capabilities that they see, but then everybody goes home and there's no easy way to follow up. And when there's no easy way to follow up, sometimes that means there's no follow up at all. So what, this, what happens and some of the feedback that we got is that industry in effect gets a pat on the back and a gold star, but there's no mechanism to actually take it to the next level, no mechanism for the government to get that uh, technology on board quickly. So under our new, what we call Plug Fest Plus approach, we intend to put in place a mechanism whereby a vendor, if we're wowed and if we need that capability, 
could well walk away with the contract within just a few weeks of the event. And we're going to do this by combining these industry events with an army acquisition model, which we've learned about, which we think will minimize the barriers for, com for companies to participate and to speed up the ability to follow up. Now, our first Plug Fest Plus Industry Day will be January 20th at George Mason University. It's hosted by the Association for Enterprise Information. And we have decided to pick a particular target for this first go round. We've decided to demonstrate this strategy with the Air Force's Distributed Common Ground System, otherwise known as the DCGS. And this, some of you may know, is a system that produces intelligence information from data collected by a variety of sensors, most especially from the unmanned uh, systems, but from other ISR platforms as well. Now, why did we pick DCGS? Well, it seemed like a good fit for this first industry event, given that it is based on open architecture. And of course, open architecture is key to the whole PlugFest concept as well. So if this event proves successful, we intend to take steps to evolve the process to other Air Force applications. I also hope that some of your companies will consider participating in the $2 million prize in our first of this magnitude Air Force Technology Challenge. So Air Force Technology Challenge is our next initiative. Um, now, the challenge is an Air Force Research Lab-led effort designed to expand competition and facilitate rapid technology development. The $2 million prize is the largest offered by any military service and will go to the competitor with the most innovative solution for developing a mid-sized turbine engine for commercial and military platforms. We chose that particular target because a uh, engine of that type would be especially helpful for us going forward in the world of our remotely piloted aircraft. Now this technology challenge, as well as the Plug Fest Plus, we believe can help us bend the cost curve in two ways. First, both approaches, pro both approaches should open the door to non-traditional contractors by lowering the barriers to entry. And second, we hope that they will both spur innovation in very specific areas where we really need the help. Now, let's turn to improving our internal processes. During the first round of bending the cost curve industry engagements, the number one recommendation that we heard from corporate CIOs was that the Air Force should establish a business analytics capability. Now, Many large companies already have such a capability. That is to say, they have a capability to uh, systematically collect uh, certain types of data, analyze it, and from that, they can draw some pretty interesting conclusions. That, in effect, is what business analytics is all about. Now, let me be clear, we're not talking about gathering data about which websites people visit or how often you buy a product. That's not the type of data that we're looking for. Um, but the data we're interested in, if we do this right, should help us answer questions such as, will this new database that we're thinking about um, investing in, will it really make us 30% more efficient? Or if I spend $5 million in this system today, how long will it take to pay back uh, and you know, double my investment or at least return on my investment? These are the types of questions that we're interested in. We need to get an enterprise view of our information technology spend so that we can understand the trade-offs and make wise future investments. And at the moment, unfortunately, we do not have a solid view of our, uh, inter of our in information technology spend. So therefore, as a result, we are going to stand up an IT business analytics office. Um, in the future, if we want to do a database uh, which would accomplish X, we want to first know before we invest that X has a business case, that there's empirical data to back it up, and that there are metrics that we can measure and make sure that it's <laughs> delivering on the promise. So what we're really after is a data-driven approach to our IT spending. Um, similar efforts, as I said, in the private sector have produced results as much as 25% cost savings, and we hope to share at least in some of that success in the future for our U.S. Air Force. Now, here's another thing we intend to improve. Um, Bill LaPlante and General Wolfenbarger recently issued a best practices memorandum which captured 24 best practices which were identified in collaboration with industry through these sessions that Ellen talked about and through some other data that we collected. 
And we believe that, the, that this uh, best practices memo and the implementation of what the memo says will help reduce the time to award for contracts where there is only one known supplier. So remember that ridiculously high 17 months to award the contract when there's only one uh, vendor that can do the work? Well, we are uh, enacting these best practices throughout our acquisition force and beginning uh, to measure the results. We will be measuring results on a first monthly and then eventually a six month basis. But ultimately, we are driving to get that 17 month average down to the single digits. So we are expecting to see some good results in that regard. I also want you to know we intend to reduce the overall number of contracts where, th where there is only one known supplier because competition is always better than sole source. And of course, we want to speed up the competitive side as well. The third way we're improving our internal acquisition processes is through what we call the Matchmaker Project. Now, that's not Match.com. That's the Matchmaker Project. It is different. Um, the match major, Matchmaker Project is collaborati collaboratively sharing lessons learned from acquisition successes across industry and across other Air Force <laughs> portfolios. So in other words, when a company has a success with the Air Force, we want to apply those lessons um, learned on pending projects with a different division within that same company. And we also want to apply those lessons learned and share that information across our Air Force amongst our acquisition professionals. Um, now, those of us currently serving in either government or industry, and of course, I've done both, so I'll speak from my own experience, I think we can all admit that we don't always collaborate in a company across divisions as perhaps we would all like, or in government across the different parts of government as we would all wish or like. So the idea of the Matchmaker Project is to take that head on. Now, we've already had some good success with our first endeavor, which happened to be with Lockheed Martin and the C-130 and Sibbers teams. Back in October uh, of 2014, Lieutenant General uh, Ellen Polakowski, who is the military deputy to build the plant, invited our C-130J team and the Lockheed Martin Aeronautics team to be part of an information and best practice exchange session. This session also included members um, of the Air Force, obviously, as well as members from Lockheed Martin Space Systems, which is the division of Lockheed responsible for the Sibbers program. Now, this was matchmaker in action because it provided an opportunity to share knowledge and best practices across those two parts of that company. And in turn, these best practices which uh, learned by the aeronautics division of Lockheed inspired new thoughts on improving program management efficiency within the space systems division. And ultimately, it's going to help our Air Force achieve better affordability in both the C-130J and Sibbers programs. Not only is this helping us implement better practices for C-130J, but we're also developing cross-enterprise awareness within the Air Force and within Lockheed. And so to trans that, translate that a little bit more clearly, we took lessons learned and best practices from the Sibbers program, which was handled in one division of Lockheed, and we took that show on the road to the other division of Lockheed. We all sat down, we collaborated, and out of all of that, uh, things are changing a bit and it will drive costs down ultimately for our Air Force. Now we're currently uh, working to expand Matchmaker to involve more industry partners and more segments of the Air Force por portfolio and to formalize Matchmaker as part of our ongoing acquisition improvement uh, process. So more to follow on this at a later date. Let me wrap this at this point um, and conclude by saying that bending the cost curve is going to require, as I said at the beginning, um, for the Air Force to be strategically agile. The concept of strategic agility, we are dead serious about it. We're also very serious and we need to apply persistent focus and bold leadership. And that is also going to require ongoing dialogue between the Air Force and our industry partners. Bold leadership, I might add, also needs to come from our Congress. I never miss an opportunity to call upon Congress to end sequestration. It will be extremely damaging if we return to it in FY16. And also to make additional changes as they and we develop them and put them forth to improve our acquisition process. Now, all of the ideas I spoke about today, however, um, are within the chiefs in my purview. 
Um, and they all came out of these industry dialogues um, that Ellen referenced earlier on. They can all be implemented within our own authorities, as I said, and so we are marching out to do so. And by the way, um, there is additional uh, information on all of the bending the cost curve initiatives that I mentioned, uh, which is, I believe is available in the back of the room. And of course, um, Janet Wolfenbarger and Bill LaPlante and Cameron Gorgo and Poor can also provide um, additional context as well. So stay tuned. Um, this is just, just the beginning of this effort. You should expect to see more activities emerge in the coming months. Um, as we continue to engage with industry and other key stakeholders on this uh, bending the cost curve initiative. Now, I don't pretend that any of this is easy. None of it is easy because it involves change and change is hard. But I would submit it's worth putting the effort into it and we need to stick with it because today we are the best air force on the planet and it is up to all of us to keep it that way. So um, I look forward to building our future together um, thank you very much for your attention this afternoon and look forward to continuing the dialogue. If you sit there, yeah. I'll sit here. All right. That was really uh, terrific. Uh, I can hardly imagine a secretary of a military department more uh, uh, impressively able to uh, come and give a very meaty uh, conversation and discussion about acquisition management. Uh, it obviously reflects uh, the depth of your experience both in industry and in government, but it is exactly uh, what I hope for in this Defense Industrial Policy Series. So thank you Great, very, thank very you. much. Um, a couple of points of uh, order. One is uh, to remind everyone that this event is entirely public on the record. Uh, the secretary knows that. Uh, those of you in the audience on whom I may call to ask a question, please make sure you wait for the microphone, identify yourself. Um, so, so, that, uh, so that it can be on the record. Secondly, uh, we're gonna end sharply at 5.30, uh, which gives us about 20 minutes right here. Uh, I would ask all of you to uh, uh, show some uh, discipline and consideration of what I'm sure are gonna be a number of hands that go up in the room uh, when you frame uh, your questions so that we can get through a number of them. Having said that, I'm going to take at least the first question. <laughs> um, I actually have two, one up at the strategic level, one maybe down at the tactical level. I have formed the impression, and it, and it culminated certainly in Secretary Hagel's um, speech in California that launched, uh, or formally anyway, launched the Defense Innovation Initiative, that there is a sense, a little sense of alarm uh, in the leadership of the uh, Department of Defense about our technical competitive advantage, about um, uh, how, how uh, 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 putative competitors around the world may be gaining competitive advantage over us technologically. Am I hearing that right? Um, is, there, is that part of what informs your own obviously personal attention uh, given to improving the acquisition system? Steve, I would, the way I would characterize it is we are <coughs> concerned. We are concerned because of successive uh, budgets in the most recent years where perhaps we have not invested <coughs> in, in all of the key areas uh, where we might have otherwise wanted to invest mm -hmm. for the future. Why is that so? We've been very, very directed at the here and now, which has been the war effort over the last 13 years. And so right. some of those technological, uh, technological investments just haven't been made, and we think now is the time when we need to start to double down on some of that. So I would say you're hearing uh, concern going forward, and you're also hearing the way I talk about it is persistent focus and persistent leadership. The team now in the Department of Defense, Secretary Hagel, Secretary Work, uh, Secretary Kendall and so forth, right on down. We're, we're all very, very um, focused on this now and we're prepared to stick with it. Um, again, it's partly innovation, but it's partly bringing down our costs because we all believe that um, our budgets are going to be restrained, uh, constrained for the foreseeable future. And to use my phraseology, we've got to make every dollar count. We can't yeah. waste it. Uh, we got to stretch it, and we can't just keep asking our people to work harder and harder and harder because there's fewer people. So we have to look for new ways to re-engineer how we do business as well. Or we'll end up with one airplane in 30 years. Right? That's right, right, and that's not acceptable. So my more tactical level question is, um, I have, have served in government like you, and um, this coordination of requirements and keep, you know, program management, key performance parameters and budgets is, is the holy grail of an enormously complex problem. Um, I, I can only commend your attention to coordinating that again. I wonder, it, can you give us a little bit of insight as to maybe what special is going on, particularly between the uh, civilian leadership and the uniform leadership in the Air Force that's helping make that coordination happen to which you alluded? 
a lot of crosstalk. So you heard me talk about the crosstalk that has been going on between government and industry. Well, within government, we've been doing an awful lot of crosstalk. Yeah. Um, particularly this team that I've called out of Bill and, and Janet and, um, and Cameron, they have been driving the train and they are ensuring that this crosstalk is, uh, is happening on a regular basis. And as I mentioned, the chief and I are taking a very specific interest, perhaps not on all programs because there are so many, but we are focusing on a number of programs programs, which will become the highlight of what we call strategic agility. And as I said, we're dead, we're dead serious about this. Okay, thank you. Indeed, I will take questions uh, from those of you who uh, would raise your hand. There is a question right in the fourth row there. If our staff could quickly bring the microphone over. Thank you. I'm Heidi Jacobus from CyberNet Systems. Um, we have experience with innovative technology, and besides bending the curve, I think we need to pierce the sides of the buckets of color of money, because oftentimes innovation is disruptive. And so we work in robotics. Robotics replaces human manpower. Manpower is paid for a color of money bucket called operational maintenance. Uh, a robot is not a human being. So therefore, even if we save one one hundred times the money that the human operation costs, the money cannot be transferred. It can't be. Right. So here's I, another, I have a long another experience in this, and I know, I know <laughs> that's <you>. true. Yes. <laughs> so. No, no. And Heidi, I don't know this with certainty, but putting on my old hat from the House Armed Services Committee days and just talking about um, uh, the color of money as it is laid out in the, uh, the rules of appropriations and whatnot, that's a very tough nut to crack. If there is any way to have flexibility within our existing authorities, I mean, we do have certain fast track authorities to speed things up, and, but they're limited. And I'm not sure that what you say can be accomplished without law changes and going to Congress, which again, is not impossible. It's, it's a tougher nut to crack. And the focus that we were trying to take, at least for this initial tranche of initiatives, is let's, let's attack some things that we have control over, that we can produce. And that's not to say the other things aren't important also, but recognition that that would take a lot longer. So I'm going to go to the back of the room. Having started near the front of the room, um, there's a gentleman right on the aisle about halfway down, please. Quickly. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, man. It's uh, Aaron Meta with Defense News. Oh, hey, Aaron. Uh, holding my laptop here, so I didn't want to stand up. Um, wanted to see if you had any thoughts about how important it is to think about the industrial base when you're issuing an RFP uh, with these new initiatives. Is it something that you're going to put an emphasis on in terms of, okay, we need to protect this sector, we need to protect this type of technology being developed in the U.S.? And then I'm wondering if you can talk specifically about the LRSB and how important that is for that program. So let me take the, the LRSB uh, first, if I might, Aaron. So the long range strike bomber, of course, this is one of our top three um, acquisition priorities in the Air Force. It is a, a new program, which is highly classified, so it's very limited, the information that can be shared about that. But I think to your question, is it a big, big priority for us? The answer is yes. Um, there have been no changes really to speak of in uh, any of the parameters. And again, I realize the parameters that we've been able to discuss are, are uh, somewhat limited. But when we roll out the FY16 budget, you know, the budget line will be similar to what you saw in 15 projected into 16. So you're not going to see any big changes there. Of course, we're on track for our uh, competition, but it remains a top priority. It is truly the future of our, uh, of our bomber force. So we're, we're going to invest in it. Um, coming back to your first part of the question, having to do with the industrial base, uh, yes, it is a concern. And certainly, uh, when it's brought to me, to, brought to my attention, for example, that a particular sector is particularly fledging, fledgling, and I, I, I take it seriously. I will say that was not a huge uh, consideration in this first tranche of initiatives. There were no particular industrial based drivers that led us to the particular initiatives um, that I talked about today. But um, it is a concern, particularly if the industrial segment in question is producing something of a very uh, significant uh, national security um, importance. I'm going to use that question to uh, squeeze in another of the things that I had wanted to ask you, and that is um, uh, I, I really uh, think, as, as Ellen has testified, that the um, effort 
that the Air Force, uh, not uniquely, but the Air Force has, has put into engaging industry is, is really absolutely commendable. And I think the relationship that the Air Force and I think the whole of the DOD has with industry is good on, on the whole. Nevertheless, um, and particularly because you do come with uh, experience in industry, uh, now that you've been in office for a year, um, what is, uh, relative to the things you need to get done in bending the cost curve, what is our industry collectively really good at and you can, you can, you're going to really be able to lever that capability or capacity in order to solve these problems, and what could they be better at that you'd like them all to work on a little harder? Wow. Um, yeah, sorry, but. Yeah, that's a hard one, Steve. Yeah. Um, well, they're good at many, many things. <laughs> I mean, we depend on industry literally for the vast majority of our production, our technology, so industry is good at many, many things. I think what we have all been lacking in is we've been lacking in that crosstalk and that mm -hmm. understanding. I think, um, again, going back 30 years when I was on Capitol <laughs> Hill, I can sort of stand back and reflect that um, these things go in waves and the, and the pendulum swings. So we go through periods of openness with industry where we recognize the importance of the crosstalk but then there'll be a scandal or two mm -hmm. or three, and the pendulum will swing hard, and everybody will become so concerned with procurement integrity that they're afraid to talk to anybody without four levels of lawyers yeah. in the room. So I think this is what has happened to us over time, and so <clears throat> if the chief and I and these other leaders can leave some kind of a lasting impression, I would hope it would be in that effort to swing the pendulum back toward that better crosstalk, because I'm certain that we will get um, a better product at a better price if we can just um, do some of those trade-offs that I talked about. Okay. Uh, third row, right there. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry. Jim Hassick, Atlanta Council. You were, uh, were talking about the Plug Fest play uh, thing that's going to happen at George Mason. I'm I'm fascinated, I'm really excited about the idea that some of these innovative scrums could lead directly to contracting actions. But then you said something about we're gonna use an army acquisition model, and I'm really, uh, I really wanna know more about that because I don't always, I think there's a wide variance of, uh, of performance in the army's acquisition system. So what's really good that we're gonna, that the Air Force is gonna try to leverage? So I hope I get the phrase right, but in our reviews and in talking to people and our research, we came across um, what's called the Other Transaction Authority, which is uh, an authority within the Army, and, but we can use it, and uh, it would allow us to do a more rapid acquisition. Uh, that would be the best way I could describe it to you. So this way, if participants come to our Plug Fest Plus, and um, they bring a capability which relates to that project that I told you about that we really need and we get excited about it and we want to take it to the next step, we're going to use that Army model in order to try to put it under contract quickly. Vice the way these things usually work, which is people go to these uh, affairs and they go, wow, this is great stuff, how do I get it? Either they can't get it or it's too long drawn out and everybody kind of gives up and goes home. And that was the feedback we got. So by using this um, Army model, we hope to do better. And I will reiterate um, what you've mentioned, which is there should be a piece of paper or a couple pieces of paper that have the details of Plug Fest Plus uh, on it on uh, one of the tables outside the room as all of you are exiting. All right, back to this side of the table, please. Uh, right there next, uh, that gentleman right there, right beside you. Oh, Thank you. Me, not the yes. one next to me, the one next to him. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for taking the time to come here. And thank you for an insightful talk. I have a quick comment and then a question. Uh, the comment, as long as Dr. LaPlante is here today and General Wolfenbarger and yourself, you believe, I, you said I believe that you want to improve uh, communication between the Air Force and contractors. But in my opinion, it's never been at a lower level, and that is due to the travel restriction. And I would like to respectfully suggest that the travel restriction needs to be revised because it's hurting you, it's hurting the Air Force, and it's hurting industry. And uh, it's difficult for the Air Force to come and see us, and so now we have to go see the Air Force, and that's very expensive. Mm -hmm. The question 
is about joint programs. Uh, our Congress has mandated that whenever possible programs be joint. However, it turns out that when they're joint, they're more likely to have a breach, which has to be reported to the same Congress. The cost goes up and the timeline gets extended. Is it uh, perhaps time to revisit joint programs in the interest of saving money and speeding up the acquisition process? Thank and before you. you sit down, would you identify yourself? Please? Oh, I, I apologize. I apologize. Uh, my name's Ross Duckworth. I work for a company called Polar Therm. We're Thank a you. prime contractor of the Air Force. Thank okay. you. Um, as to the question on joint programs and is it time to revisit and perhaps not do them, I hope not. I hope not. I, I think that would be a step backwards. What, what I would like to believe is possible is that we could learn the lessons from the past of perhaps what went wrong with those other programs that you referenced and hopefully not repeat those same mistakes going forward and instead learn from them and do better. That, that would be my, my hope. Um, in tough budget environments, I think joint programs particularly come under attack because services maybe perhaps try to protect their service-specific programs. But I think it would be a, a step backwards for our country if we sort of threw up our hands and said, too hard, I'd rather try to learn the lessons. And in terms of the travel money, I think you know our absolute worst year for that and many other things was the year of um, sequestration. I do believe it's eased up a bit since then. It's certainly not back to where it was. And I'm not sure it'll ever be back to where it was because, again, I think we're going to have constrained budgets. But certainly, if um, our president's budget level uh, is approved uh, in FY16, vice the sequestration le level budget, we'll all be better <laughs> off for it. But I hear you on that. I take your point on that travel issue. I'm going to take the question right here in the fourth row, please, on the aisle. Uh, I got the same problem with the laptop. That's all right. Uh, I know Colin, you, Colin Clark, breaking defense. <laughs> um, so it sounds as if uh, you've got two sort of different themes going here. On the one, the best practice sharing information. That's primes because they've got huge staffs and lots of people to do that kind of work. But the plug fest and some of the other stuff sounds like you're uh, very uh, consciously targeting smaller businesses. Uh, obviously not ruling anyone out, but uh, is that a correct uh, conclusion or uh, is this uh, plug fest uh, something you're just going to hope stuff comes in from uh, small businesses, uh, even if they aren't very familiar with your processes? Well, I, I would hope all levels of business would check this out and think about participating. Um, now, the big primes who are used to doing business with us, it's a whole lot easier for them because they know the ropes. The smaller businesses, but again, some of those great innovations reside within those smaller businesses. This hopefully would attract them as well. But as you pointed out, it's not really meant to exclude anybody. It's meant to be very, very inclusive. And the, the goal there is, um, is to see if we can improve our innovation on that particular program I mentioned, the DCGS. But are you consciously using this plug fest way to hopefully bring in more small businesses? Well, we're, I would say we're consciously using it to try to uh, improve innovation and test out this concept that if we can put in place a rapid acquisition model so that there can be follow-up when we are interested in what we see, that that will get you know, better participation and we'll get to our goal sooner and better. Okay, all the way in the back. A woman right on the aisle, please. Secretary James Andrea Shalal with Reuters, thank you for being here. Um, I wanted to ask you about the ongoing effort that you have to certify SpaceX, and I know that that's the subject of a lawsuit, but I wanted you to put that effort and also the RD-180 replacement effort in the context of this acquisition reform. How are you going to do things faster? You've announced an independent review. Do you think the certification process should have gone faster so that you could be getting this competition that you're looking for? 
my personality, Andrea, is I'm always looking to speed up any process that I come across. So I'm never quite satisfied with whatever the process is in place. But of course, processes are in place for a reason. And then you have to peel back the onion and understand what's going on there. So with respect to um, SpaceX and the certification process, I, I just want to reiterate, um, I am big time in favor of competition. Everybody I know in the Air Force is big time in favor of competition. And uh, the team has been working hard to try to get SpaceX um, certified as quickly as possible. We had hoped that by the end of the year it was going to happen, and I think we were all disappointed. I know I was disappointed that it didn't happen. But there is criteria that's laid out in writing um, that the Air Force signed up to and SpaceX signed up to, and 80% of what needed to happen did happen by the end of December of last year, but there's still 20% yet to go, and this is real engineering process. So this is real stuff. So we're still working hard because it's going to serve our best interests, our national security interests, and we think the competition um, in the space launch business is going to help drive down costs as well. So it's in our interest to work hard to get this done, and I can assure you that um, General Greaves, who is the certifying official, um, has put money, and he has put people, and he has put personal focus uh, to get this done as quickly as possible. Again, uh, disappointed that it didn't happen uh, at the end of December, but to me it is not a question of um, if, it is a question of when this will uh, happen, meaning the certification. Last point is, um, you're right, I did uh, call for an independent panel because simply I would like some uh, independent advice. I'd like a fresh set, set of eyes and ears uh, to look at this process. We now have about a year and a half under our belts doing it with SpaceX. What have we learned in that year and a half uh, time frame? Uh, are there ways to streamline? Uh, how about, let's look at how NASA does this. Let's look at uh, best practices from commercial launch. What can we learn? And from that review, I hope to get some recommendations that may say it's perfect as is, no change, or it may say, hey, streamlining can occur in the following ways. And then I would take that on board. So that's the idea of the independent uh, review. Thank you. We are going to have to wrap up. Um, before I thank you uh, uh, with some final remarks, I wondered if you wanted anything else to say before we uh, close the event. Um, just again, Steve, and to the rest of the leadership here, thank you so much for um, having me here. I miss all of you guys at the Atlantic Council, so I hope I'll get another invitation to come back um, again, because as was mentioned, I am an alumni, I think very highly, um, of the organization. And I also want to thank Ellen and other members of industry who have been participants. I feel like, you know, this is not just our plan, this is the plan that that we built together, and um, this is the type of crosstalk that we need um, for the future of our Air Force, so thank you. You're very welcome. I'll just observe, uh, I have been around the eternal struggle to improve the acquisition system probably 20 years now myself, and um, the one necessary condition to any improvements I've ever seen happen is committed, engaged senior leadership. And your presence here to get today together with, with Bill LaPlante and General Wolfenberger is, is exactly that kind of active uh, participation, the talent that all three of you brings to the matter just adds to the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of it. So thank you and, and thank you for coming here today. Thank you. Thank you.